I'm Leo Phillips, host of This Must Be The Gig. We're a weekly podcast that documents everything about the world of live music. Speaking with choreographers, costume and set designers, the people who run beloved venues and festivals, and, of course, speaking with musicians about that one gig that changed their lives. Get your peek behind the curtain at consequenceofsound.net, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org, or listen the good old-fashioned way by tuning to 91.9 on the FM dial from Louisville Public Media. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org, Consequence of Sound, and the Consequence Podcast Network. And I'd like to say hello to all the subscribers. Thank you for checking out the series every single week, the multiple interviews that we put out every single week. We debut new ones on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And if uh, if you feel so inspired, please do give the series a rating and, and a review wherever you're listening to it from right now. And if you're not a subscriber, please do hit that subscribe button. Again, you can get it wherever you get your podcast from. That is anywhere in the entire multiverse. Just type in Kyle Meredith with and subscribe away. I am Kyle Meredith, and the with today is Jay Sum. He's back with a brand new record called Enico, and it's a record that kind of lives in a few different spots in the world, uh, both in L.A. where she's living these days and in the Joshua Tree Desert. We'll talk about what the allure of Joshua Tree was for her, how it benefited the songs, and with a straight week-long writing session, what themes came through. We'll also hear how inviting a bunch of her musician friends into the sessions this time around changed the dynamics. Her double life as a producer, she recently produced the latest Chastity Belt and Pendant albums. And being a multi-instrumentalist, she loves the bass, she plays the trumpets, and the drums, and the guitar, and probably much, much more that we didn't even talk about beyond that. Melina will also get into her many influences, not just from this record, uh, folks like Prefab Sprout, Alanis Morissette, Steely Dan, but also from her... uh, parents music collection having grown up and the concept behind the album title itself talking about the record and co it's kyle meredith with jay sum hi kyle this is melina congratulations on this new record it is one of my favorite things that i have heard i guess i should say this fall now it sort of came out at the end of the summer but it's became my my fall soundtrack Mm -hmm. perfectly suited so congrats it's a beautiful record thank you so much yeah a lot of people have been saying that it's a it's a fall record so it's nice to hear does that mean much to you, like the um, what you think it is versus, versus what the perception ends up being? Do you find that it's very different? Yeah, it's usually different just because I, I think it definitely depends on when the record is released. Like uh, like if something's released in the, in the summer, then I'm going to be like, oh, my God, this is my summer record. But, yeah, it just depends on when it's released, and I think that people can sort of latch on to that decision maybe based on like the sound of the song well you know when you talk about the the two places that where i read about anyway where this record was put together i mean you've got la and then you've got joshua tree in the desert uh and and while i know there is a story about one night it's snowing in the desert it's still the desert and and while we think of it as a fall thing do you think of it more in in that sense like the desert record kind of yeah yeah i i every time i look at the cover um it really matches with the sort of story of how the the process uh began with like the tracking and recording and stuff because i was surrounded by this the desert and i was in la all the time and it's so dry there and it kind of feels like the desert all the time but yeah yeah it feels like a desert record to me for sure as far as joshua tree goes i know that's a magical place that or it seems like a magical place anyway that a lot of artists seek out for for very specific reasons what was the allure for you to go out there I decided to go out to Joshua Tree because I was so distracted in L.A. Um, I'm currently based in Highland Park in like northeast Los Angeles, but the house that I'm in is like really beautiful and like spacious, and I can always play music uh, all the time without receiving complaints. But it's very loud. Like there are always cars zooming by. Like we live on a street that like basically comes out from a freeway, so people are just always driving fast. And there are just people outside yelling all the time. And uh, 
we also live across like a, a club and that's always playing music and there's people yelling. So um, that would kind of like seep into my recordings along with like my roommates talking a lot and like partying. So it got to the point where I was like very frustrated and I was like, I need to force myself to kind of leave this chaotic energy for a second and just like force myself to be in like solitude and silence and just make music and write it and record it as like as much as I can and Joshua Tree was the perfect place to go to it's not too far and uh it's extremely quiet very lonely yeah yeah and and a lot of these lyrics came together within that week session right yes so when you're writing that much at once do you find that the that, that the threads build um more so than they would when you're writing an album over a, a long period of time yeah, yeah, I think that uh, that's definitely my style in general. Uh, I will write lyrics at the end. I think I've always been sort of like a procrastinator, and I need pressure to finish something. Because uh, if someone were to give me a deadline for lyrics uh, for, for like six months, then yeah, I'm going to wait until the very end to write them because I don't like mulling over my thoughts, and I think that ideas can change and morph into something better and something just like a little more different than you thought it would be. So I love to just like accept that things change over time and um, you will always have fresh ideas. So it's, it's kind of like the, the concept of killing your da- darlings, you know, All right. you just get rid of your favorite thing. I know another part of the story on this is against like the first one when it was really just a solo record that you did invite others into the recording process this time around. How did that change the dynamics mm-hmm. for you? Did it did it change your writing style at all or was it just kind of here's the bass and now you guys add the color? I think it was a mixture of wanting different like styles and bringing a new perspective to the table when it comes to instrumentation because the way people play completely different from the way that you play and it does bring a different energy and to a record to have different people on it and I think I just got really tired of hearing myself drum I got tired of like being the person doing everything because I'm also producing and I'm also mixing and engineering and it just made sense to invite a lot of like my talented musician friends to play because they're so good at music I just send a demo and I say hey can you play this and then when we we record there's more room for uh, experimenting and there's more room for me to be like can you try like this can you do it like this and I guess it's more limited when it's just me and I'm mulling over the way that I play because I can't reach a certain level that a lot of like uh, professional musicians can and um, that's why I decided to like enroll more people into this one. I, I'm only going to laugh at your use of the word professional musician because in my eyes, you are about the most professional musician that I think I've talked to lately as for someone who can do so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> but, you know, and, and even when you're handing the reins over like that, I mean, you have to have a, I, I would assume, I guess I should say, you have to have a really strong sense of, of who you are as a musician and what you want. Like, like I guess the question is, like, <laughs> after the the first first record which was kind of the demo and then the proper debut did you have a better understanding of who you are as a musician this time around yeah i definitely know what i want and i do know what i can bring to the table in terms of like skill set um, i think my production skills are a little more refined through recording people throughout the years i think i i'd love to spend as much time as i can uh, helping people with their records and their eps or singles and I love working with my friends because you can learn something from each session with them. You can apply it to yourself. And I think I, I and without that, I feel like I wouldn't continue as JSON because I'd just be bored all the time. <laughs> and we should bring up right there, too. I mean, uh, you produced the latest Chastity Belt. I think I just saw Pendant. Is that the newest one? Yeah, Pendant. So at this point, like you're, it seems like you're as busy as a producer for other groups as you are for yourself. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to be more busy, though. It used to be my plan B producing, but now I want it to be like uh, plan A. Uh, I, I definitely want to keep doing that. And I want to kind of make that my main career, probably in the future, most likely. How drastically different, if at all, is your approach to producing someone else's record versus versus your own? Versus my own? Uh, I love to take a backseat more often. I think um, 
it's important to get a vibe of the person and see how you work together. I think it's just like any workplace environment. You have to get used to each other, um, kind of find out what makes each other tick and just be willing to offer as much advice and support as you can and kind of cheerlead this person because it is really vulnerable to work with someone, talk about your vision, and you kind of get embarrassed, you get nervous. And um, I think that's where I come in. I can be like, I've been there, and here's what we can do, and you offer support. That's the best thing that you can do. You're not there to fix their problems, and you're not there to like make them something that they're not. You have to basically bring the best out of them. And this might apply then more to to your own music, but as I read about, you know, which instruments you're attracted to now more than than maybe others, like I I think you were talking about recently, like really loving the bass guitar right now. Like if that's so, Mm -hmm. does that tend to lead the direction of how you want to write a song then? Like, do do you, I mean, because when I think of the bass, when, when, if if it's a bass led song, it's probably more of a groove led thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important to me. I think, um, if I'm like, I really, really, really want to make like a dancey track or like an R&B track, then I'll start with like drums and bass first and do something really simple. But I think that's the cool thing about the bass is that it's such a foundation for a song and it can be melodic as well as like rhythmic and um it just adds so much like power to a song and i think it's more important than people think i mean there's there's almost as many bassist jokes as there are drummer jokes so you're probably right about that <laughs> true true yeah well, yeah and maybe you're you're too far away from your your high school band days with the trumpet but i thought man horns seem to be mm-hmm. making a bit of a comeback right now maybe, maybe it's time i don't know really? What was like the tra- chain smokers or something? Well, not just the chain. Like it's <laughs> happening a lot in in indie rock and 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 like um, Alex Leahy bringing the saxophone back and and even uh, oh you're uh, right like Sa- even on the you know maybe the more mainstream side of indie rock like Sam Fender he's got the horn. I'm like something's happening right now. So if there's ever a time for you to bring that trumpet back, I think it's it's happening. Oh yeah, I think it's very very like I guess valuable and popular to being multi-instrumentalist right now like it's cool that you play guitar but it's even cooler if you play saxophone so i I do get what you're saying i feel like you see more people using it as like a i don't want to say gimmick but it definitely adds to a live show or like it adds to a person's story when you have like two instruments on stage and it's something like that you wouldn't expect like a trumpet or a saxophone so Cool. Like uh, Lizzo and Cautious Clay bringing out the flute, uh, similarly. Oh, I mean, that's the most, that's the coolest, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. I honestly never saw that one coming. Like, oh, man, the flute's going to be yeah. a thing in 2019. You're the flute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask about a, a, such a specific moment in this record that maybe has no story at all. But Tenderness, you know, it, it is the newest single, and I am so in love with it. Mm-hmm. And as a DJ, Thank you. that stop gets me every single time when you uh, the drop yeah <laughs> yeah and it's such a magical moment when it opens up and i don't know is there is there a story moment of that in the studio where where you chose to go with that i feel like that sort of stop is just such a classic thing in music kind of like a phrase especially in like i think like funk music jazz music just any genre that uses that break beat kind of blah, da, 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 da. it's just such a satisfying feel for a drummer to play so yeah i don't know it's it's funny it's kind of like it's 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 just like an introduction to a new section of the song and it's very like confident and bold sounding it's when the wizard of oz changes from black and white to color that's what it is for me in that song oh it's a good one (laughs) I always kind of avoid the, uh, I've, I've always avoided the influence question with artists because it's kind of a crap thing for a, 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 an interviewer to bring up a crutch. But <laughs> it seems like you actually, this is something you lean into. Like it, it becomes like, I don't know, a talking point for you in a different way. Like when a lot of artists do downplay it, you kind of bring it up a lot of times. And, and I'll only bring up a few of the ones that's been mentioned, uh, Prefab Sprout, uh, Alanis and, and Steely Dan which are just three great, different, very different things, you know. But how big a role does that play for you versus maybe the attention that's thrown to you in that lights? Like, like you said, I don't, I don't downplay it because I think it's very, very important to talk about your influences. And I think, I think people that downplay are just like lying because they're definitely listening to their favorite artists over and over again to get the same sound or whatever that's where inspiration comes from and i think if you don't 
have that inspiration and you don't give it the credit that it deserves, then, you know, it doesn't, what's the point? But, um, yeah, I think it's very instrumental into, like, the way that you grow as an artist. And I think, like, those artists really, really, really inspired me for, for the new record. And it, it's kind of like an immediate inspiration when you can, like, kind of go through your Rolodex in your brain and think about, like, certain artists and, like, certain parts of songs that you want to take inspiration from. Yeah, it's, like, really powerful, and I think it's important. Now, your your dad was a DJ. Uh, how many of those come from his own selection? Oh, definitely a, a couple, for sure. Like, a couple of main ones, like Earth, Wind, and Fire. That'll be... That'll always be like a huge inspiration. I think he just introduced me to the classics, like Michael Jackson and Carey, and all these like amazing musicians and singers. And uh, I think they'll they'll just be with me for a long time because I just grew up with it. I ran away from oh, my yeah. parents' uh, music for a while. I think in my teens, like I can't. Oh yeah. Yeah, like I'm in the middle of Kentucky, and it was like what I call River Rock. It was like my mom was listening to Bob <laughs> Seger and and Credence and and that stuff. And oh it, god, yeah. Well, <laughs> and and in my 20s, suddenly I'm hearing you know a uh, Hollywood Nights and Night Moves on the radio, and I'm thinking, I love it just because I know it. It's in me. I, I'm I'm not going to run away from this yeah, anymore. <laughs> yeah, but you just know it. You know it too well. <laughs> That might be an easy seg, too, because the the album title has a really sweet translation. And I was wondering if you could talk about that as well. Yeah, yeah. The album title translates to My Child, and it's in uh, Tagalog, which is the Filipino language. And um, I think when I came up with that, it was super last minute, and everyone was asking me what the title was going to be. And I remember just looking through my phone, and I stumbled on some text with my mom, and she always, always greets me. Like, hi, Anako, I love you. Like, hi, Anako, what are you doing? It's like this very endearing thing, and it kind of puts like a, it puts like a certain feeling into the record. Like, it gives it such a blanket, like a warmth that I feel just basic, a basic title wouldn't. And it's kind of funny because I feel like it doesn't really relate to a lot of the songs and or the themes of each song, but it just means something to me, and it felt good at yeah. the time. It still does, yeah. When, when you have to come up with an album title, it's almost like, do you have to come up with something that does all encompass everything within that album? I, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, you can honestly, you can name anything, whatever you want. That's the crazy part about life. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it is just a fantastic record. I can't say enough great things about it. I do love listening to it. In Thank the you. summer, in the fall, whatever season, I'm sure it's going to sound great later on as well. So. <laughs> It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for giving the call today, and thank you so much for this music. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. Hopefully we'll see you around these parts at some point. Uh, But otherwise, uh, take care out there. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye. Huge thanks to Melina right there, talking about the new JSOM record, Anikko. It is now available. And thanks to you for checking out the uh, series today. Hopefully before you get out of here, wherever you're listening from, you'll give the series a, a quick little review and a rating as well. And again, if you're not subscribed, now is a great time to hit the subscribe button. Wherever you're listening from, just type in Kyle Meredith with. That does include iTunes, Apple Podcast, Acast, Stitcher, Podchaser, Spotify, YouTube, and all the rest of the places around the world. After that, you can head to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song debuts, music news, anniversary spins, and even more interviews. At 6 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound, they've got your music and film news. You can also find me at Twitter, at Kyle Meredith, and Facebook, slash Kyle Meredith. And that does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.